Okay, welcome back, everybody. Good to have everybody back. Looks like we got at least 95% of the people to come back. Um, it's a great pleasure I have the opportunity now to introduce Commissioner Savinicki. Commissioner Savinicki was sworn in for a second term as a commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on June 29, 2012. Her first term began in March of 2008. She came to the commission from a position on the staff of the Senate Armed Services Committee, where she worked on issues such as nuclear defense programs, nuclear security, and environmental management. Prior to her work in the Senate, Commissioner Savinicki worked as a nuclear engineer in various positions with the U.S. Department of Energy, both in Washington, D.C., and in Idaho. Before that, she was an energy engineer for the Wisconsin Public Service Commission. And as many of you know, Commissioner Savinicki has a quick and dry wit, and she has demonstrated this many times in these Rick speeches. I'm sure she won't mind me sharing this anecdote with you. The Commissioner has been very supportive of me, uh, both as a regional administrator and then in the past six months as the uh, director of the office of NRR. But she gave me some advice when I started with the job in NRR when we talked about some of the challenges that they were facing. And she told me if I was not going to be part of the solution, I was the precipitate. So with that, I give you Commissioner Savinicki. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction and for warming up the crowd with a, a bad joke. There might be more of those to come. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to take part in this year's Regulatory Information Conference. Thank you to each of you for attending this session and also for all of you tuning in. We have a number of remote broadcast locations so that our regional staff and other offices can tune in uh, without having to travel to this particular location. Also, uh, I think we're live webcasting, or if not, it will be archived. So to those of you who tune in later, thank you for tuning in. I, I want to add my thanks to those of others, to all of the many NRC employees who both work on this conference in its preparation and then volunteer to do a lot of the important logistical tasks throughout the week. Um, it is their efforts uh, that make the conference a success each year, and uh, so I want to thank them. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge as well our many colleagues in attendance joining us from across the country and from around the world. Uh, thank you for traveling the distances that are required to be here. To those of you who have welcomed me into your power plants and facilities and academic institutions throughout the course of the year, uh, I want to thank you for sharing uh, my journey of continuous learning as an NRC Commissioner and for communicating your experiences to me firsthand. I think it's a very important part of, of regulating uh, with true comprehension. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of important partners from other federal and state agencies who are here today. The NRC's many critical relationships with other government entities are essential to the achievement of our mission. Thank you for taking the time to be here and, in many cases, for agreeing to be presenters at one of our technical sessions. Finally, thank you also to my own staff for your assistance and support throughout the year. So I am grateful to all of you. I've expressed a lot of uh, gratitude. Uh, I'm also really grateful for the opportunity to be standing here today. Uh, I recently read, I've been maybe focused on the concept of gratitude. I read uh, last October or November the most wonderful expression, uh, a definition of gratitude. It said, uh, it was from uh, Melody Beatty, and she's written a book called The Language of Letting Go. But she wrote, gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough. Speaking of enough, this is my seventh Rick speech. Uh, I was sworn in on March 28th. Uh, so when the Rick rolls around for me in mid-March, it's kind of the, we have fiscal years and calendar years. For me, this is the end of my NRC year. It's kind of the, the turnover. And each time I approach the Rick, uh, I try to come at it uh, afresh and anew because uh, we have many folks who come every year. I'm sure we have new participants as well. But at the end of the day, I have to confess to you, I try to come at it afresh, but this is the raw material. It doesn't change. I'm kind of, you know, this is what I have to work with is me. So the pattern is set. Um, so for those of you who uh, enjoy what I do, it's unlikely that you'll see a departure from that today. 
I'm always working at the last minute to prepare for the RIC as if I didn't know it was coming or something, which is kind of crazy. But um, that was true again this year, and this is a phenomenon that my sister uh, was charitable enough to call your process. It was, we were talking on Sunday and she asked me, uh, well, you know, what constitutes the rest of your Sunday and your Sunday evening, just as family members do, and I said, well, I need to get started on a speech that I am going to be delivering on Tuesday, and I expected her to be, we have a, we're very close, and she's my older sister, so she's not, she's very free with her feedback and criticism and advice. I expected her to be critical of me, and so it was, it was refreshing that she said, but that's your, your process, Christine, that's how you do things. So, you know, I, I just say bless our families, right, because they can take what we don't find a strength about ourselves and they turn it into this winsome, you know, quirk that we have that is a, a good thing. So that's my process, I guess. Now, Eric Leeds is not up here with me. I've done a lot of Ricks and I'm accustomed to having uh, Eric here. Um, Eric is gone, like so many others. Uh, we have the very capable Bill Dean, and he's showing himself to be very capable today. I told Bill before we got started, I said, the buzz in the room is that this appears to come quite naturally to you. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't always do well with change. But, Bill, it's all right, because I'm on my fourth chairman, my third EDO, and so I can deal with a change in moderator. That's hardly the biggest change I've seen in my service as an NRC commissioner. But the curious thing is I, I find that I'm becoming more sentimental about things as, I, as the years go by. I don't know if this is something about moving through life. No one warned me about it. Um, I seem to notice all this change. Maybe it's kind of staying in one place for a while and you, you become an observer, a first-hand witness to the kind of the river of change that goes on and flows into the vast sea of change that is life that is constantly uh, moving on. And this past New Year's, which is also a time to be melancholy and reflective, uh, or to go to a big poker party, which I also did, um, but I had time to be melancholy, partly because I went all in and I blew it. I have a very uh, forward-leaning betting strategy that uh, is not commensurate with what's in my hand, though. I figured, oh, just, you know, through posture I can pull it off, but uh, I had more experienced people at the table with me. Anyway, we all had fun. But um, the song Old Lang Syne, I, I was just really started to dwell on this because partly I've always been amused by this song, which uh, is not an American invention by any uh, stretch. It's uh, Robert Burns. I don't know if that's any relation, Distant or other Steve. It's, it's, our Chairman Burns is shaking his head, but perhaps distantly he is related to Robert Burns. But um, it's a very, very old song. Of course, it's a drinking... It's a drinking song, so um, that's why it's um, gone in and out of uh, fashion or stayed, uh, certainly stayed around for a long period of time. I just, can you still hear me? My mic's gone a little strange, no? Okay. I don't know. It changed on me. Is it not? Are the people, someone in the back raise their hand if, if it's amplifying to the back? Oh, they're not working. Well, what are we going to do? Should I, does your, mic, does your mic work? Should I do it from the table? No. Oh. Well, this is very interesting. Can anyone hear me at all? Okay, some people do I have to do it? So I'm going to have to give the speech like this. This is going to be really not very fun for me. So, because I, I have a lot of pages to go, so brace yourself. Um, you know, it was interesting. I'm going to, I don't know, maybe we won't get through this. Um, so my mic went off. So that's new, Dean, if you've provided for that. That was a new thing that you've done. You know, it's kind of like operator training or something. You've got to throw scenarios at them, and, and okay, thank you for that. But uh, nice try. Uh, this is an. Did anyone watch Saturday Night Live? And the opening skit was that wonderful actress who impersonates Hillary Clinton. But she said, you know, for those of you who think I'm going to go down over scandal acts, she goes, nice try. That isn't how Hillary Clinton goes down. So. Um, <laughs> so you cutting off my mic is not going to stop me, Mr. Dean. Um, but, you know, I was, <laughs> okay, I've gotten a sign that they're working on. I'll just continue to have this awkward posture of looking like I'm about to, you know, in the football line at the scrimmage. Um, 
I was told once, and this was in some times when, the interesting times on the commission, um, Chairman Yatsko's chief of staff came to my chief of staff, Joe Sharkey, and said, uh, I want you to know that we're aware that Commissioner Semenike's picture fell off the wall in the lobby, and only her picture, by the way, but we're having it rehung, and I, uh, Jeff told me that I hadn't been aware that my picture fell off the wall. But I said, great, the, 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 the actual atoms of the building are rejecting me now. They're just shoving my picture off the wall. Um, what was I talking? I was talking about old Lang Syne. Okay. Uh, I was sentimental, yes, in talking about that. Um, I will remember this very fondly, this moment of having the mics not working well. Um, so people sing this song, and the most uh, interesting thing about it is that nobody remembers the words, and uh, we don't know the verses. By the way, it's a very beautiful lyrics and a beautiful song if you ever hear like an acoustical rendition. And all the stanzas that nobody sings because nobody knows the words to are a wonderful reflection on journeying through life with friends, you know, throughout the course of life and then remembering them. But the funniest thing about it is that confusion about what the song means is captured so perfectly in that bit of, of dialogue between that movie When Harry Met Sally. Does, does anybody remember this? Because the big romantic culmination is at a New Year's party. But it, kind of to break the tension and is because it's a, a romantic comedy. So in case I needed to find that, that mixes romantic elements and comedic elements. So the comedic element there is that Harry looks at Sally because the song is on and he goes... Uh, what does this song mean my whole life? I, I don't know what this song means. I mean... So he goes on to say, and my mic is working, yay. Should old acquaintance be forgot? Does that mean we should forget old acquaintances? Or does it mean if we happen to forget them, we should remember them, which is not possible, because we already forgot them? <laughs> but I like Sally's response, because she says, well... Maybe it means that we should remember that we forgot them or something. And then she goes on to say the most beautiful part. She goes, anyway, it's about old friends. So although it has absolutely nothing to do with the Rick, I started talking about Eric. We had the thing with the mics. This is a little recap. And I lost my train of thought. But the point is that I have uh, made a lot of friends at NRC in this many years uh, that I've been there. And, and that isn't something that I took for granted. I'm sure I hoped for it. I don't know that I expected it, but um, I, I'm very, very grateful for it. And uh, so we do, as Bill said, we see a lot of the people who have moved on to other opportunities here at the RIC. That's a kind of special element for those of us here at NRC. It's, it is a bit of a reunion, and I'm grateful to see many of you. And for all you've done to contribute to my learning in my time as an NRC commissioner, uh, there have been a lot of changes, as I noted, but some things change and some things don't. Uh, one of which is that there is an expectation among some of you that I will uh, give you a joke. Um, I've given this advice to others, and I will look, I think, expressly at Commissioner Barron. And if you're going to tell a joke tomorrow morning, you will have to tell a joke forever. So I hope that you will think long and hard about that. By the way, you're... Um, you're a second day commissioner and I, I feel, you know, I was a second day commissioner at the RIC for a long time and, um, you know, the good thing about it is like you should just claim tomorrow as yours. It's like the, the, the field is yours alone to occupy. It's your territory. And I really look forward to your remarks uh, tomorrow morning. So, uh, and I would like to, as I stand, I stood at the RIC, it's been the practice more often than not that I am uh, publicly welcoming and expressing my pleasure at serving with new members of our commission. So I will uh, do that right now and say uh, uh, I have uh, been very pleased to work with first Commissioner Burns and then Chairman Burns and Commissioner Bear and I, I really welcome them both to our commission. I look forward to our continued work together on the important issues in, before us in, in, in concert with our colleague uh, Commissioner Ostendorf. So, uh, so now on to the joke. Okay. Now, not everyone wants to hear this joke, but those of you who don't can get on your smartphones if that's what you desire to do. Um, but the narrow part of the audience that wants this and encourages me slavishly, and you shouldn't do that because you get what you want. Okay, so Helium walks into a bar and orders a beer. The bartender says, sorry, we don't serve noble gases. He doesn't react. Get it? He, H-E, he, and then the, he doesn't react. 
Now, the only, the only thing better, the only thing better than over-explaining a bad joke, which is what I just did, is telling a second bad joke. <laughs> Have you heard about the new band called 1,023 Megabytes? They haven't had any gigs. <laughs> okay, so we've dispensed with that. I have this, you know, I'm fussing with my hair, and I heard George Apostolakis is here, although I have not been able to see him and say hello to him. He used to go after me and then talk about fussing with his hair, and it was so fun. But I have a piece of hair that won't fall where it should. Women and others, maybe men who are, have long hair, I don't know. There's some that do. We'll, we'll have some sympathy with this. But it is, um, it, that, that, that clump of hair decided to be the bane of my existence today. Is that why you shut my mic off is so that I wouldn't say that? <laughs> okay, um, I have, I generally share with you some thoughts that have been on my mind as my sister was kind enough to describe as, as my process. Uh, I will also note that I collected these thoughts for you at a time when I had given up caffeine for three weeks after a 30 year love affair with coffee. Um, I had never given it up for that long. So I'm going to look at work product now and go, what did I produce in that three weeks and what did it look like? I broke down this morning. I shouldn't admit that. But woohoo, after you don't have it for three weeks and you have a cup of coffee, boy, you're ready to go. <laughs> um, so on Sunday night, as I told my sister, according to my process, I'm working on this. I'm watching The Walking Dead. I'm on my work email. On the commercial breaks, I'm jotting, jotting down things I wanted to just talk about. Uh, looking through a file of ideas that I, I just gather over the course of the year. That's also part of my process. Uh, I'm doing laundry. I'm preparing lunches for the week. And uh, it occurs to me uh, that that fits perfectly because one of the things I wanted to talk about is a concept I've re heard referred to as the too muchness of our lives. Uh, last June, uh, a Swiss-born philosopher, Alain de Botin, he shocked the world, or at least his nearly half million Twitter followers, when he tweeted that everyone should delete Twitter from their cell phones. Now, he was contacted by the Washington Post to elaborate in more than 140 characters on his particular social media philosophy, and he responded as follows. Twitter is, of course, a wonderful thing, but it is also the most appalling distraction ever invented. It sounds so harmless, but it wants you never to be in touch with yourself again and never to have time to catch up on the updates from the person you really need to keep close to you, yourself. He went on to say, we need relief from the Twitter-fueled impression that we are living in an age of unparalleled importance. We need, on occasion, to be able to go to a quieter place where that particular conference and this particular ep epidemic, that new phone and this shocking wildfire will lose a little bit of their power to affect us. A flourishing life requires a capacity to recognize the times when Twitter no longer has anything original or important to teach us. Periods when we should refuse imaginative connections with strangers and hashtags. When we must leave the business of complaining, insulting, haranguing, exclaiming to others in the knowledge that we have our own priorities to honor in the brief time still allotted to us. Taking this concept even further, the author Carl Greenfeld, in a New York Times piece entitled Faking Cultural Literacy, comments on the superficial nature resulting from our attempts at following so many topics at once. He writes, it has never been so easy to pretend to know so much without actually knowing anything. We pick topical relevant bits from Facebook, Twitter, or emailed news alerts and then regurgitate them. Instead of watching Mad Men or the Super Bowl or the Oscars or a presidential debate, you can simply scroll through someone else's live retweeting of it or read the recaps the next day. Our cultural canon is becoming determined by whatever gets the most clicks. What we feel now is the constant pressure to know enough at all times lest we be revealed as culturally illiterate so that we can survive an elevator pitch, a business meeting, a cocktail party, the visit, a visit to the office kitchenette, so that we can post, tweet, chat, comment, text, as if we have seen, read, watched, listened. 
What matters to us, awash in petabytes of data, is not necessarily having actually consumed this content firsthand, but simply knowing that it exists, having a position on it, being able to engage in the chatter about it. He notes that a recent survey by the American Press Institute reveals that six in 10 Americans acknowledge that they do nothing more than read the headlines of the news. And in a crushing moment of honesty in his own piece, he notes parenthetically that he knows this only because he skimmed the Washington Post headline about the survey. He continues as follows, it's understandable that one party or even both parties in a conversation may not have the faintest idea of what is being talked about. We're all very busy, busier if I believe the harried responses when there are any at all to most emails I send than any previous generation. And because we spend so much time staring at our phones and screens, texting and tweeting about how busy we are, we no longer have the time to consume any primary material. We rely instead on the casual observations of our Facebook friends or the people we follow, or well, who actually. Who decides what we know, what opinions we see, what ideas we are representing as our own observations? At the end of the day, I suppose uh, it's, it's hard not to feel a little bit kind of pushed around by the system, by all this busyness, by the tyranny of it, by the weight of it. In the, in the Commission's vote this year on the use of qualitative factors in regulatory decision making, I quoted from an essay by commentator and author Margaret Wenta entitled, I'm an adult, stop nudging me. She observes the following, the idea that public officials have a duty to help you do what's in your own interest has taken off with a vengeance thanks in no small part to something known as nudge theory. Nudge theory, which was invented by two guys named Robert Thaler and Cass Sunstein, is, the, is on the face of it quite benign, she writes. It recognizes that we are flawed, irrational, and occasionally foolish creatures who, left to our own devices, cannot be relied upon to save, retirement, save for retirement, eat our vegetables, or floss. The idea behind nudge theory, also known as soft paternalism, is to design public policies that make the right choices much easier. The most obvious problem with nudge theory, she writes, is that it divides the world into we and they. We are the informed, the dispassionate, the rational ones who happen to be in charge. They, the poor schlubs, are myopic, lazy, poorly informed and poorly controlled, they need to be saved from themselves. The other problem is that regulators and governments are people too, she writes. They have their own fallibilities. A third problem is that soft paternalism can morph pretty quickly into soft authoritarianism. That's the problem in a nutshell, she writes. It's a short step from nudging people to terrorizing them and pushing them around. Many fields, especially public health, are full of people who think they have a corner on the truth. These people often bemoan the fact that the public doesn't trust them. But the reason we don't trust them, she writes, is quite simply that they are simply imposing their own preferences on the rest of us. Now, in an exaggerated in sense, our incessant busyness has now become its own competition, its own tyranny, but it's also become a kind of a, of a prestige and a status symbol. In an essay entitled, You're Probably Too Busy to Read This, the Washington Post staff writer, Bridget Schulte, builds on the subject. Her essay begins as follows. One man says he works 72 hours a week because everyone in his office does. He's thinking about cutting back on sleep so that he can become more productive. A woman says the last time she had a moment for herself was when she went for her annual mammogram. Then another woman bursts in, apologizing for being late to the focus group convened precisely to discuss the fast pace of modern life. She got stuck in traffic. I look at the author writes, I look out the window from our perch at the bar of the 18th story Radisson Hotel and see a handful of cars at a stoplight. Beyond that, acres of cornfields. We are not in Washington, New York, Los Angeles, or some other type A city. We're in Fargo, North Dakota. She writes, somewhere around the end of the 20th century, busyness became not just a way of life, but a badge of honor. 
and life sociologists say became an exhausting everyday a thon. People compete over being busy. It's about showing status. We do this even as neuroscience is increasingly showing that at our most idle, our brains are most open to inspiration and creativity. She points out that our views on, on leisure have changed very dramatically in a short period of time. She uses these statistics. She says, during the 1950s, the post-World War II boom in productivity, along with rising incomes and standards of living, led economists and politicians to predict that by 1990, Americans would work 22 hours a week, six months a year, and retire before age 40. In, a, in a kind of another cultural theme, uh, she said, she writes that while accepting the Republican Party's nomination for president in 1956, Dwight Eisenhower envisioned a world where, quote, leisure will be abundant so that all can develop the life of the spirit, of reflection, of religion, of the arts, of the full realization of the good things of the world. Think about that statement from a, a presidential candidate accepting his party's nomination. And if you reflect on it for a moment, our current thinking diverges so strongly from that sentiment that when I try to picture any of the potential candidates for president in, in, in uh, 2016 campaigning and espousing any similar theme, I, that seems like preposterous to me. Nobody would say that now. You know, Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres, is a, if I really enjoy her comedy, and she had a bit, she was reflecting on the show um, Mayberry RFD. Does anybody remember that show? It was just, I'm the only person. I grew up at a time before there, before there was cable, and networks, broadcasters needed to fill content, and so they rebroadcast a lot of sh old shows. But she talked about how that show begins with, uh, you know, Andy and Opie walking down the street, and it's just whistling. And she, this was her comment, I never forgot that. She goes... When there's time for whistling, there's a lot of time in a show when there's time for whistling. <laughs> and so we, we've come really rather far from that concept. Now, uh, I, I don't preach about all of this from, from some lofty perch myself, some state of perfect alignment and inner harmony and peace. I'm, I struggle like everyone else in this room. On top of that, some of you right now are smirking because I'm known to be a, uh, what should we say, a rather um, focused individual. Uh, and it's true that I care a lot about what I do. I consider being a commissioner a real honor and a privilege, and it's a very, very solemn uh, responsibility to have laid on your shoulders, even though it's an honor and a privilege. Um, but I also care about it, you know, because life is finite and precious and uncertain, and we all know that, so consequently, I would say that um, I'm sure I, you know, some will take exception to this, but I, I think sometimes that putting all of yourself into the things that you care about is all you really have, you know, to contribute, to bring. Sometimes you bring all of yourself uh, into an issue. I, I guess I share, uh, there's many management philosophies, different things work for different people, but I, I read something written by Admiral Rickover that I, uh, agree with him. He, he, well, he was repeating that the devil's in the details. He didn't invent that, but um, he may have said that he invented it, but he didn't invent that phrase. But, but he said it this way. He said, the man in charge must concern himself with details. If he does not consider them important, neither will his subordinates. It's hard and monotonous, <laughs> it's hard and monotonous to pay attention to seemingly minor matters. In my work, he said, I probably spend about 99% of my time on what others may call petty details. Most managers would rather focus on lofty policy matters. And this is the part that resonates with me, he said, I've because I've observed this. But when the details are ignored, the project fails. No infusion of policy or lofty ideals can then correct the situation. Still, in those disquieting moments when I'm fatigued with doing the hard and monotonous work and I'm still plagued by doubt that, you know, the permanent stench of failure is going to hang over everything I do, 
Uh, it would seem that stepping back and having a, a reasoned and perhaps more elevated approach to the concept of what we care about and why we attempt anything is called for. Uh, in this vein, I found insight in the writing of author Anthony Doerr. He wrote a piece entitled Costume Drama. It was about a tragically bad homemade Halloween costume he had made when he was seven, and it was really an amusing piece. But more broadly, he's commenting on the themes of, you know, a trying and failing, and uh, he writes about it this way. He says, I'm a novelist. Every day I fail. My drafts, when I complete them, which is not often, are inevitably shadows of what I had hoped they would be. I can't ever fully execute the glorious and inarticulable dreams in my head. It has taken me 30 years to appreciate the wisdom of my mother that the beauty is not in the result, but in the attempt. To build our castles in the clouds, we need to live with the fear that we will stink, that no one will pay attention, that we will fall like trees in the empty rainforest. The fear that we are going to take our glorious, flawless, nebulous ideas and butcher them on the altar of reality. Or, as Flaubert put it in Madame Bovary, None of us can ever express the exact measure of his needs or his thoughts or his sorrows. And human speech is like a cracked kettle on which we tap crude rhythms for bears to dance to while we long to make music that will melt the stars. So although I work very hard on preparing my votes, uh, some days I come closer to expressing that exact measure, as it was called, of my thoughts than others. The Commission's current deliberation on the integration of the staff mitigating strategies work, and it's a deliberation that's still ongoing, work is still ongoing, but it was a unique voting opportunity for me, and my vote will be made public when the Commission finishes its work on this matter, but it allowed me to step back because this issue on, mid on the integration of mitigating strategies work and flooding work became to me kind of emblematic of taking stock of where we are since Fukushima, what we've done, what we've looked, looked at. And so I did want to express one piece of that was that larger reflection of stepping back and saying, where are we now? We're nearly four years out at the time I wrote this vote um, from that uh, tragic occurrence. And I wrote the following based on this broader reflection. I said, I respect the work of the near-term task force whose members did yeoman's work in 90 short days and whose final report stands out among those of other nations in erudition and thoughtfulness. But it is time to speak plainly to the fact that no one has the whole answer in 90 days. In the intervening years since the task force's report, the Commission has deliberated and closed their recommendation one, and the Commission staff, as a body made up of hundreds of experts, has taken the task force's good efforts and advanced the agency's thinking significantly beyond it. All of the agency's contributors are to be commended for their long labors to this end. To the extent that this paper advances merely, merely one in a whole series of informed refinements to our regulatory response to Fukushima, the Commission should continue to foster this NRC culture of continuous evaluation, feedback, and improvement. To do otherwise would be inconsistent with the NRC principles of good regulation and detrimental to the cause of safety. My vote continues and concludes by saying, U.S. nuclear power plants are operating safely. From statements made by an agency former chairman as he stood in the Rose Garden with President Obama in the earliest days after the Fukushima accident, to testimony given last December before the U.S. Congress by our most recent former chairman, NRC has given and repeated this assurance. In responding to the Fukushima event, therefore, the NRC's obligation to the American people is fulfilled not through an elusive search for a state of perfect knowledge of risk, the adding of decimal places to analyses of high, consequences, high consequence events of small probability. It is fulfilled through the achievement of tangible real-world safety improvement. In the United States, this approach has yielded significant regulatory action and industry response thus far. The staff asks us to reaffirm that we intend to stay this course 
and pursue this goal for the reassessed flooding hazard and presents the staff's stepwise implementation actions for a rational means to its achievement. I affirm this goal and provide my support to the staff's intended actions. I wanted to share that with you again. Uh, Chairman Burns talked about this earlier. One of the pitfalls, I think, of being a commissioner is that we look the least holistically at issues before the agency. The nature of our process, and it's a good process because it le it's very structured and disciplined, it's scrutable, it's transparent, uh, it, it yields a public voting record, a decision record, so people know not just what the commission did but why we did it. But the unfortunate nature of it is like the candy processing line for, you know, Lucy. Uh, things go past. We don't get to look across to actions. We're very focused on what's in front of us now. I wanted to share that because it was something I'd written in a contemporary sense that reflects on all of what we've done since Fukushima. Uh, and as uh, my first chief of staff, Jeff Sharkey, told me, said, nobody reads your votes, so we need to talk about them. Um, so I've done that now. But I, the, the things we care most about are going to manifest themselves in our actions in a manner, though, that's uh, unique and individual to each of us. The key is in conquering the tyranny of our busyness, our too muchness, our everyday a -thon. And doing so, as the philosopher Alain de Botin that I quoted at the beginning said, in the knowledge that we have our own priorities to honor in the brief time still allotted to us. And I think uh, I'll finish. I don't know what my time check is. Am I leaving time? 20 minutes. Okay. So um, I think one of the most uh, poignant articulations about this came in President Ronald Reagan's 1981 inaugural address, which I, he was known as being a really eloquent speaker. And I'm a real fan of that particular inaugural address. Uh, for the first time, the ceremony had been, the swearing-in ceremony, if the first time in modern history, let me say, the swearing-in ceremony had been moved to the west front of the Capitol, if you're not familiar with the D.C. geography. That provides the most sweeping vista of the District of Columbia and all of our national monuments. So when he said this, the audience would have been able to kind of uh, pivot their head around and see that. But um, he said, beyond those monuments to heroism, and he was talking about the various, the Washington, the Jefferson, he said, is the Potomac River, and on the far shore, the sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery, with its row upon row of simple white markers bearing crosses or stars of David. They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has pay, been paid for our freedom. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the framed Rainbow Division. There, on the Western Front, he was killed, trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war, therefore, I will work, I will save. I will sacrifice, I will endure, I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost. As if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. Admiral Rickover expressed the same idea when he stated, act as if you were going to live forever and cast your plans way ahead. You must feel responsible without time limitation and the consideration of whether you may or may not be around to see the results should never enter your thoughts. I believe it is the duty of each of us, he said, to act as if the fate of the world depended on him. Thank you. You need to know that Mr. Dean just did a little theatrical ploy with me. He wanted me to finish my speech, so I don't actually have as much time as he said. But it was a good ploy. All right. Um, You're tricky, man, learning that about thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So uh, these questions actually uh, are, are kind of grouped together, but basically they orient around what would your priorities be uh, in your remaining time as a commissioner, or what things would you want to change at the NRC if you could? I, it's funny, when I first started at NRC, people said, you know, well, what do you want to achieve? What's your agenda? 
I really honor the work. The, the, the agency's mission is so important and the people are working there that I feel serving in this type of position is like stepping into a river and there will be papers that were ongoing when you stepped in and you'll join those deliberations and not everything will be completed but at the time you leave you're going to leave some issues open that you didn't have a chance to see through to conclusion but I think that uh, turnover on the commission is a matter of law it's intentional and so you will step in and out and I don't bring a personal to-do list or a set of, of checked boxes I think in terms of what I would like to see changed, I wouldn't frame the question that way. I would stay. I've become impressed that NRC is capable of so much. I think that um, I want to see NRC uh, be as great as it can be, and I think that that's uh, in, embedded in Project AIM. I think that's a lot of our, um, what Chairman Burns called a midlife crisis. But I got to tell you, honey, you don't have a midlife crisis at 40, okay? 40 is the new 30, and we don't have a midlife crisis at 40. But you can, you can think that if you want. Um, you know, I think we want to, to have the, the fullest expression of what we're capable of, and I look forward to watching the staff do that. I think that's an organic thing. It hap happens within the organization. Politicals kind of come and go. We're part of that, uh, part of that constant change. But uh, I look forward to seeing NRC on this journey of further improvement. And I think they have everything, they have everything at, at their hand that they need to be not just successful, but I think stunningly successful at that. They need to dig deep and do that and want it and own it for themselves. Um, I have a handful of questions here that are oriented around the same thing, and that is uh, the Part 52 and design certification review process and your views on, on the timeliness of, of that process. I don't make a lot of uh, forecasts. What I do is I look at, you know, what has happened. And so I try to be very fact-based, as is NRC's culture. Uh, we have seen that uh, some of the design certifications uh, and again, they're for large light water reactors, which is something that we have a lot of experience in regulating. Uh, they've taken longer, I think, than the crafters of Part 52 would have predicted. The COLs, same thing. So uh, I know that we are in a process of always looking at Part 52 lessons. We've not exercised the entirety of Part 52. Is that my mic again? Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's how they'll get me off stage. In any event, um, I think there's a lot, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom embedded in those who crafted Part 52. It wasn't me, so I'm not being self-congratulatory. Uh, I think it, it's got a lot of wisdom embedded in it, and we just need to be sure that we're executing it true to the core uh, of those who generated it. They felt it was an improvement on the way things had been done, and they created it, but we need to execute it consistent with that. Okay. The last, the last question I have. I'll repeat yeah. it right okay. closely into my yes. microphone okay. like I can do. I can right. get back into uh, that But basically that involves uh, multi-generational work issues with basically four generations of people. Isn't that great, reason? though? I think of that as it, the, the question suggests that having four generations of people overlapping in a workplace or on a team, uh, well, I, I didn't say that in the question, but I interpret it to be like that's a challenge. I Mr. Ostendorf, you're going to have fun up here. Um, I think that that's a real strength to have that. I am so enthused in dealing with young generation in nuclear with, you know, whether or not people are members of that, just the incoming professionals into nuclear. <coughs> I think. Because this is a generation of people coming in, that they're not going to be content to just take what is, the, is bequeathed to them and say, this is the technology, you know, it's your, it's your dad's Cadillac or Oldsmobile or whatever that tagline was. They want to take the nuclear sciences and these technologies and make their own imprint over the course of a 30, 40, 50 year career, whatever it's going to be. And I love the fact that I come in there and they want to change more than the carpets and the drapes. They want to, you know, that's why they're excited about SMR. But they're just, they're excited about the promise of this technology applied 
to the issues that their generation and future generations, as they see it, will have to solve. And so uh, I think it's tremendous strength to have different generations all uh, collaborating together. I think, I think in the absence of that, uh, I think we'd be much weaker than we are. Now, there's a, there's a question that I would have liked to ask, but you don't have to answer it, which is, does your poker betting strategy somehow apply to how you do your votes? Um, but oh, my gosh, there's a ton of strategy in being an NRC commissioner. Are you kidding me? It's fun. Um, a poker hand. Actually, I'm probably too forthcoming. I, maybe that's why I lost all the money. The interesting thing, it was such a great group, because at more than one time, the person with the most just said, they didn't want me to leave the table. Maybe they just found it amusing to watch me lose, like, all my bank after my, my bankroll. So they would just shove chips over at me. And so I lost not only my own uh, bankroll, but, like, all kinds of other people's. But they kept winning it back for me, so maybe they didn't really care. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, their strategy. It's been interesting because uh, I, you know, I'm not always have much of a prospect of success. Uh, success being, of course, you know, wanting to win, um, wanting to be on the prevailing side of a question. So you do work within the art of the possible. You look at how you might shape really essential elements as opposed to just uh, being a part of being the prevailing view that carries the day. I, I've tried to communicate this <coughs> in terms of the agency's own non-concurrence and differing views process is, you know, I know what it is not to be on the prevailing side of a question. There's this so amusing to me that the commission itself really models the notion of there's different views and somebody prevails and somebody doesn't. So I thought really the notion of non-concurrence and differing views is so organic to the whole commission structure, the way our agency is, is you know, topped by a commission, our structure gives the, the perfect role model, you know, that at the end of the day, a decision has to be made. There are those whose views carry the day. There are those, uh, and, I, you know, from personal experience, I know uh, it's not fun, you know, being in this category. But if you went out there and expressed it on, honestly and candidly and it didn't carry the day, there's no dishonor in that. And that doesn't mean that somebody was good or bad or anything else. So uh, um, I, you know, I, th I think that that's a real strength of the commission. But there is, sure, there's strategy in it, of course. It's got nothing to do with poker. I'd like to think, if it, however many years I'm at NRC, I reflect back on that, I will reflect on a record of greater success than my poker playing. <laughs> And unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We have to see the stage to Commissioner Austin yeah. Dorsey.